Slow Medicine Radio. Our host is integrative medicine doctor Michael Finkelstein. Michael offers medical advice from a holistic paradigm, including both medical and metaphysical philosophies from the full spectrum of human experience. Slow Medicine Radio offers fresh ideas on how to attain a state of wellness that seems distant given the limitations of today's medical paradigm. It introduces you to thought leaders who connect the dots between theory and practice, examining health from a broad perspective with regards to medical diagnoses, conventional and alternative therapies, healthcare policy, and related topics that warrant further thought and discussion. Slow Medicine Radio does not prescribe to take this or do that. Instead, it offers an open-minded, intelligent, and practical approach to living, resulting in greater health individually and collectively. Here is Dr. Michael Finkelstein, the founder of Sunraven, the home of Slow Medicine in Bedford, New York. Welcome to Slow Medicine Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Finkelstein, and I want to first wish you a happy new year. I want to tell you that my hope for today, for those of you who who may be home, not working, and listening And thinking about this new year beginning, uh, my hope is to offer something today that might actually help you achieve the state of health you've been hoping for for years on end. Uh, This is a time many of us make New Year's resolutions. And my guest today will be able to explore with you one idea for how to make that happen in one of the most interesting, creative, and delicious ways possible. So that's the tease. We're here every Monday at 5 o'clock on WVOX, 1460 on your AM dial and worldwide at WVOX.com. And not only do I want to help you with your health, but I also want to help you explore the nature of your life because I don't think those two things are really different subjects. I think often we get caught up in the physical ailments uh, and our life goes on without us. When we, when we flip that around, when we focus on our life and get our life in balance, our health, our physical body tends to love it. So that's the, the twist uh, in this program that I think offers a slightly different perspective. And, of course, I do understand and appreciate science and what that says and how it informs us to make decisions in our lives. But it's one piece, and the other pieces are really the day-to-day and include a lot of our relationships, not only the relationships we have uh, with each other, but the relationships with uh, the natural world. And so today's subject is going to be gardening and gardening for health. And my guest is the slow medicine horticulturist, Xenia D'Ambrosi. And Xenia has been working with us at Slow Medicine for, and at Sunraven for two years now and was invited initially because uh, through a mutual friend, uh, we were looking when we were getting married to develop and redesign some of the landscape on our property so that the backdrop for our wedding would be so beautiful. And Xenia was recommended because her background is in landscape design, among other things. And when we met and walked around the property, Xenia had so much more to offer. And that's what I want her to share with you today. But she has an interesting personal story, which is like many of us, you know, went down the path of her uh, first career, uh, which was maybe something she'll t- share with us that she decided on when she was relatively young and she followed her pursue a path in uh, a profession uh, and did really well, but came to realize that her life depended on making a slightly different or, or a course shift so that she was living in better balance. Uh, and she found her way, even though she earned a master's in public health and got her MBA at Columbia uh, and was working in business and finance, but she found her way back to nature and uh, studied gardening and sustainable practices at the New York Botanical Garden uh, and has since been the author of many articles and developed her own business called Sweet Earth Company, uh, which uh, helps people design uh, their backyards, essentially, uh, from anything from containers to property and includes flowers and herbs and gardens not just to design them, but to learn to grow them and ultimately learn to teach, which she'll share with us. So, Xenia, welcome to Slow Medicine Radio. Thank you for having me. So, you know, my introduction sort of maybe stole some of your thunder about, you know, what got you into gardening. But the the question that I want to share first uh, is why is gardening a subject on this show? Um, Well, 
gardening and health go hand in hand. It provides um, so much more than just uh, pretty flowers or delicious food. Um, gardening is a, kind of a way of life. And so for a healthy life, I think gardening plays a, a very big role. Um, it connects us to nature. It connects us to um, good, nutritious food source, um, safe food, uh, food security. Um, but it also provides us with the opportunity for community um, and for mindfulness. And so um, with that in mind, the definition of health, as as I agree, as the, I guess the World Health Organization, many others have said, um, and which I subscribe to, is that uh, health is not just the absence of disease or the physical. It involves the, uh, the mental uh, and the social as well. And I think gardening provides, touches us on all those fronts. Yeah, so I've often referred to as gardening as healthy multitasking. Or one of the things you can do where you could, in one act, let's say just planting flowers in a container, in one act, do so many things that serve a holistic approach to health. So you're touching nature, you're doing something creative, you're you know experiencing beauty. If you are joined by anyone else in the process, it's social. Uh, it provides for you on an ongoing basis. It moves your body. Um, it it's a way of expressing yourself. I mean, in just one simple act of planting a single, you know, flower or whatever it is, like, and if you're growing vegetables, let's say, then you can actually have produce. That's a product of this down the road that then, you know, sucks nutrients from the soil and light energy from the sun and puts it into your body. There are very few things that can integrate so many things at once. I agree. Yeah. So how did you get there? You know, how did you, how did you go from, you know, sitting at a desk in Manhattan uh, to saying, gee, I think I need to get out into the garden more? Um, I like to... To say that it called me, mm. um, my upbringing is um, is very urban. Um, growing up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, um, there were parks, but not necessarily necessarily a garden experience. Um, I pursued um, business and finance, and um, after uh, getting married and uh, beginning to raise a family, moved out to the suburbs. And it was at that point that I started to enjoy um, what having a garden meant. Um, I was exploring, I was experimenting, um, and I was having fun. Um, I think that um, I stayed that course for quite a while, um, but I call it the perfect storm. There were times, there was a time in my life where um, things just fell out of balance and from a professional perspective, um, the financial crisis provided me with uh, stresses, but also an opportunity out. And um, there was a health issue that I was dealing with at the time. Um, and from a family perspective, um, managing, you know, the kids' schedule and all of that, there just there was an opportunity where um, gardening played a bigger role. And um, I used it. It called to me to uh, help me through my my illness, um, and I c- called it therapeutic uh, gardening because um, there were times when I was out there and I was either you know weeding or planting on my own and thinking things through and, and feeling that connection with nature and and feeling myself getting better, getting uh, healthier. Um, there were times when I was out there with others and that sense of community, that conversation, um, that was also very helpful. Um, and then I realized, you know, it was so special and important to me. Um, I'm sure it was that, you know, it plays a big role for others and, and I wanted to do more of it. And so I started taking courses. Um, I pursued a certification at the New York Botanical Garden and, um, and I started Sweet Earth, and it's been evolving ever since, a growing business. Um, but um, that's how I kind of entered the world of gardening. Um, it called to me, and it healed me, and so uh, I'm forever grateful. Yeah. Now, that story is one that I've heard many times. 
not everyone has taken it to the level that you have or has the ability and commitment to make it their new profession. But so many people find respite in the garden. You know, even if it's not their own, just walking in the gardens. Like you can go to the New York Botanical Gardens or the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens or Wave Hill in this area and or any park, frankly, or any river side. And the experience of just walking or witnessing or experiencing the natural world in those very potent natural settings uh, gives most people that almost immediate sense of some degree of relief. And what I would say, you know, and most people who've been listening to the show and understanding the principle of slow medicine is that relief is the experience of the parasympathetic nervous system shutting off the sympathetic fight or flight response. And so what we get are, what we're getting at that moment is a conversion of an inflammatory reaction in our body to this anti-inflammatory, calming, soothing sensation, which not only is palpable and evident in sort of how we are feeling and what we're thinking about how we're feeling, but every cell of our body is now bathing in different juices, the juices of healing and wholeness and restoration. And so anything that we do in our lives which cultivates that moment is generally beneficial. Um, And so gardening is one of those things that we, you know, we're going to talk about for for the duration of the show, which in all different ways of expressing it or, and practically gardening can, one can achieve that. So I want to ask the question sort of twofold, which when you said healing yourself, you know, in the context of your whole life, we have, we calling you the slow medicine horticulturalists. And that term horticulture though, is what I wanted to ask you about. And there's something you know, an aspect of therapy now called horticultural therapy. Maybe you can explain that a little bit. Um, Sure. But uh, first let me thank you for describing um, that sense that people get when they enter a garden or where they come into contact with nature because there's some of us that kind of um, know it in our gut um, but don't understand the kind of scientific explanation for it. And so um, that's a great way to understand it. Even mm-hmm. to thank you for thanking me, but the interesting thing of what you just said, which you said because this is our language and this is sort of how we do express ourselves, but when you say you know it in your gut, when people say that you have a gut instinct or you know it in your gut, that's where your parasympathetic nervous system resides. Um, so the the nerve endings mm-hmm. of that system you know, go up and down the spinal cord. You know, a big portion of them lands on the diaphragm's you know, they're right underneath the lungs that separate the lungs from the abdominal cavity. And then there's the whole set of nerves which control digestion, which is a very elaborate set, which is part of the parasympathetic nervous system. And yeah, you feel it there. You Mm -hmm. literally feel it in your gut. So your your words... We we intuitively know what's good for us. Well, our language has has developed around it because this is the explanation. This is what's happening. Um, And... You know, what we've lost in our culture that's moving so fast and with the expectation that quick fixes are available for things in the form of pills or products or, you know, sort of magical people um, is the simplicity of the fact that we can get there ourselves with a deep breath, frankly, or by walking in a garden. So back to horticultural therapy. So, um, you know, I I started or my introduction was through uh, food. Um, my desire to um, grow my own food, to know where it came from, to know that it was safe to eat. Um, And so I've learned how to farm. And from that, I developed a real uh, appreciation um, for the soil and for the health of the soil. And so from there, um, my, my world expanded to include um, not just the fenced-in vegetable garden, but the full landscape, and to grow um, everything and to plant and to choose plants and to design um, in a sustainable way, uh, one that fed, um, fed us, uh, that valued our land, um, that um, made responsible and conscious choices in terms of Um, how we choose to, you know, what we choose to plant and how we choose to treat our our land. Um, So from there, um, I expanded on my education from produce to uh, plants and flowers. And so my perspective is um, trying to create a place or or improve upon a place, enhance a place 
um, with respect to the value of the land and with respect to its productivity. Um, and I don't just mean producing uh, crops, um, but also uh, aesthetics and its uh, connection to um, its environment and improving the biodiversity and, and all of that. So, um, Truly holistic. Truly holistic and incorporating, um, you know, agriculture and horticulture and um, environmental science to some degree. Mm-hmm. Well, this is what I was saying at the very beginning, too, of the introduction, is that there is a science. You know, there there is definitely knowledge. Uh, there's the micro and the macronutrients. There's the, as you said, healthy soil, some of which can be measured. You know, you can see what the pH, the acid level of the soil is. You can see what the mineral content is and the absorption rates and, you know, how much organic matters in soil. You can measure these things. And there's, uh, when we, we can use that intelligently, it's like baking, we usually wind up with a much better product. But there's something about gardening because these are living systems that we we don't necessarily even want to com- tightly control in- entirely because there's something about the way nature is creative in itself that if we just can get it set up properly, we can then sit back and watch magic happening in front of our eyes. And so part of it is the co-creative process with the natural world itself and just to give it the best chance. You know, if the objective is you know, a lot of cucumbers, then there might be a science behind it, but there's also, you know, reality, which is the weather is not predictable. And, uh, you know, the, the forces of nature sometimes, you know, blow wind harder than you would like. But on the other hand, sometimes that leads to greater nutrient value in some of these plants. Uh, and flowers and trees bend in, you know, to reach the light or away from the light or around wind. And, um, you know, what we see in the art and beauty of nature has a lot to do with just it being left alone to some extent. So there's a great dance. Mm -hmm. No, it's a great balance between art and science. You mentioned horticulture as a word, though. And What's the difference between horticulture and agriculture? Um, Horticulture, uh, well, agriculture has to do with uh, with growing um, a a particular crop, whether it be a vegetable crop or a fiber crop. Um, Horticulture uh, includes uh, the plant kingdom, and so you're um, learning to grow and care for, you know, maintain um, both, you know, plants across the spectrum, um, perennials and annuals and um, vegetable crops and herbs and trees. And so um, it kind of moves outside of the outside of the uh, um, fenced in garden area or the farm and it incorporates landscapes right okay so that's the system so i am thinking when i'm hearing that and the reason i ask the question is that there's different ways of looking at health too so we can doctor can measure your physical body and say this is your cholesterol this is your blood pressure and those numbers are nice and those numbers are going to look a lot like the numbers of your neighbor um, or not but the quality of your life is not dependent entirely on those numbers there's a whole system there's a whole landscape of your life mm-hmm. includes the relationships you have with other people the unique people in your life um, and the environment and the social circumstances in which you find yourself and the culture. So horticulture, to me, as you're describing it, resembles more like what humans are, which is a, a single organism in the middle of a multicellular, multi-organism field. And there is where biodiversity and sustainability are very important principles. Certainly. Yeah. So... Um, so this all relates to health. I mean, this is not just, in a way, um, an activity, a hobby, although it can be for some, but it it's, can actually feed you, not just fit, actually literally, because there's some food sometimes that you can't actually grow, but the, the movement, the beauty, the community aspects of it are all nourishing on certain levels. Um, so that's why, again, I think it was it's so important for us at Sunraven to have you be part of our team, uh, the Associates. Uh, and I think it's a relevant subject for today because, you know, people often, you know, this first day of the year, second day of the year are thinking, okay, what am I going to do in 2017 that is going to bring me a little closer to this health ideal that I share? For me, the first part is to reorient people in terms of what the definition of that health objective is, what is health to them. And as you pointed out, not just the absence of disease, it's a way of living in your world and thriving and feeling whole and healthy and happy. 
So we say this to ourselves this time of year, Happy New Year, mm-hmm. Healthy New Year. Um, you know, that's what we mean by it. So gardening to me is, if you, you know, you could go to the gym. Okay, I'll, I'll give people a little bit of a check for, for making that as a resolution. Or you could eat more healthy. Okay, I'll give you another check. Um, but gardening, you get a multitude of checks uh, when you do that. Um, and so that's what I want to sort of encourage people to think about spending more time in nature and spending more time actively in nature, you know, really relating to it. It's, um, it's certainly an activity and a connection that nurtures the, the mind, the body, and the soul. And it's um, finding balance among that um, that I think you achieve health and wellness. And so, um, and there's more and more of body of evidence shown um, between the connection of nature um, and health and wellness. Um, and so, yeah, big check mark. Right. One of the things that you were mentioning, again, when you talk about healthy soil, people talk about and use this word microbiome to refer to the microscopic life in the soil that you can't see with the naked eye, mm-hmm. but you know is existing. All the multitude of organisms, the bacteria, the fungi, you know, small organisms, you know, worms and, and crustaceans that live in the soil and together and with organic material and old stuff. They create, you know, the right ingredients for a plant to grow. In human beings, there's a microbiome, and the microbiome exists in two dominant locations. One is in our gut, and the gut of the human being, like all most mammals, is very similar to the gut, to the microbiome of soil. It has a very similar sort of list of organism types um, that live intentionally sort of synergistically together. Now, we also know that there's some invading organisms Mm -hmm. occasionally, pathogens that mess us up in our intestinal tract in particular, but a healthy microbiome, meaning if there are the right balance of organisms, can actually help protect you from the invaders, just like we talk about in soil. When healthy soil, it's less likely to carry viruses that get transferred to plants or pests and other things. And so this is what you do. You work on that. When you stick your hand in the healthy microbiome of soil, you actually are getting the probiotics people buy in stores. I think that's where it starts. I mean, you know, um, gardening with um, an understanding and appreciation for um, growing healthy soil. Uh, A plant can resist um, pests and disease much better if it's grown in healthy soil. Um, And so a lot of... uh, uh, you know, parallels can be drawn to humans and 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 our lifestyles, but um, gardening provides so much more. And I think healthy soil is really the key. Yeah, and so I want to talk to you about how we create healthy soil in the gardens at Sunraven, and how people who are listening to us can actually join us in doing that. Um, but the other area that I wanted to mention, which is the second of the two areas of the human organism that has a microbiome, is the skin. And, you know, people often, you know, use that term, I feel dirty, um, which is interesting um, because it, would, it is actually healthy to be dirty. Um, what's not healthy is to be sterile. And so the idea behind soaps and detergents and cleansing and, you know, washing as much as people tend to do, uh, I get it. You know, smelly and dirty are two different things. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, um, you know, and there's, we live in close social quarters, so we have to have some basic hygiene. I, I get all of that. But there is a point beyond which we clean our bodies. Um, it would be like putting detergent in the soil. Um, and when you wash the wax layer off your skin because of all the soaps and emollients, uh, or you put things onto your skin, beauty products and other things, fragrances, um, you're affecting a living barrier, essentially, which is meant to protect you from things getting inside. Um, and cracking and other things. and So anyway, so I just want to point that out, that this is transferable, all the concepts that we're talking about, to just a healthy body. So you and I have, over the, and with Robin uh, at Sunraven and others who have been part of our team, have um, recreated something that when I first acquired the property 11 years ago, I started, which was a garden co-op experience. Um, but when you came to us, as I mentioned, when it was just initially, we thought just to help us landscape our uh, property for our wedding, 
Uh, but it became apparent that you had so much more to offer, and we really enjoyed working with you. And one of the things that we started to talk about right away was um, a community garden and to bring people onto this remarkably beautiful naturalized space which had a lot of potential and develop that potential. And you became really our master gardener who really helped us not just design the garden itself but the garden program around it which brings people into the Sun Raven environment, teaches them how to garden, but then gives them the full immersion into this experience of life in balance. So we call that the Sun Raven Garden Co-op, and maybe you can talk a little bit about what, what you first sort of thought about when you met us and walked the property of Sun Raven and then where we took that. Because I think, in a sense, that's, you know, our working relationship has really been, you know, centralized in that project, which is encompassing at this point. You know, we're already talking about the program beginning in March. Mm -hmm. uh, it will go from March to November this year to take up most of the year. Um, and it's a very exciting thing. So I want you to share that. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, when I first uh, arrived at Sun Raven, um, it was under the premise of um, redesigning or enhancing the landscape um, to provide this beautiful space for a wedding. Um, but when I got there, I, it was so much more. Yes, there was some areas that, you know, we added some design and some more color and some more plants. We created gardens. Um, but it was really the work that you were doing there um, that uh, spoke to me. Um, till this day, I go to Sun Raven, and the minute I get there, it's just one healthy sigh because it's a great place. It's a kind of nurturing place that um, it evokes that. And the garden itself, we made it a, a beautiful um aesthetically pleasing garden that set the stage for great photos for for a wedding um but it was really um my desire for um creating a sustainable place and um one that um uh, kind of taught sustainability and taught gardening um which i felt was really instrumental to your practice and to robin's practice and um i felt it was a great match and um, again, um, I want to improve the, the value and productivity of, of land. And um, I saw that opportunity there. And so we developed the, um, the garden co-op program, which um, is, has so many different facets to it. It is uh, an experiential program in that uh, those that participate are active in the garden. They are um, planting and harvesting and maintaining um, and they are enjoying the, the fruits of their labor in weekly harvest, similar to a CSA, a community supported agriculture uh, program where, you know, you get a weekly harvest. Um, but much more than that, because uh, you are very participatory in the process of growing the food and the vegetables and the flowers. Um, in addition, it's educational because I feel that, again, the the mission of uh, sustainability and um, food production um, needs to go hand in hand with education. So we offer monthly workshops where you are um, learning garden skills and techniques, but also um, touches on topics that are kind of about the landscape or about homesteading in particular. Um, we offer beekeeping. We offer uh, classes on herbs and herbalism. Um, we're going to be expanding that as well in this, this season and creating a course, uh, a workshop on um, how gardens can nurture our creativity. Um, so we, we're really incorporating the garden in all facets of health and wellness. Um, so in addition to um, the garden experience and the monthly workshops and the weekly harvest, um, there's also opportunity for community. And uh, we offer that through our all hands on work days where there are potluck lunches. Um, we offer uh, meditation um, and other community programs. And um, we want to kind of expand the garden um, to touch upon all the other programming that's at Sun Raven. Um, and uh, I'm excited for this season um, and for the, the workshops that are going to take place and the events 
um, around the garden, uh, cooking classes and all of that. So it's really much more than just a regular CSA. Yeah. It really is it touches upon all aspects of our our life our lifestyle. So CSAs, as you mentioned, are gaining in popularity. People asking the question that you did, which was, "Where is my food coming from?" You know, and what's the quality of it? And so farmers markets similarly are, are getting to be more popular for people to at least walk around because they're so interesting. Uh, but they also teach us a lot about what's in season, what's growing locally, and gives us access to some of those things. Um, but, and the CSA is a way, basically, once a week you go get pick up what you might otherwise find in a farmer's market. But what we want us to do and, and is consistent with the mission of Sun Raven and Slow Medicine is to not just tell people um, you know, or direct them, but to provide them access to the experiential qualities so that people get it full thickness, not just in their heads and their minds, but they're cultivating a sense of well-being because they're touching on things like social relationships, community, nature, um, the, the spiritual and the mental and the emotional and the physical techniques. So you could join a gym, like I said, or you could you know, change your diet, but you could also participate in a program like what we're trying to create, which with one membership fee, gives you access to the full gamut of those things in something that I would say is a lot of fun. I mean, I think a lot of people do enjoy going to a gym, but indoors, of you know, in a gym, you know, on a sweltering hot summer day is okay. You know, you're moving your body. I think, you know, you give people a check for that. But there's something about being outside in the rain on a July afternoon um, that I think is thrilling. Uh, and I don't see most people think, sensing thrill in a gym, no matter how many miles they've, they've run on the treadmill. And so this is the aspect. It's an alternative. It's not for everybody, but it is something that I, we know because of the people who've been interested in it over the years. Um, it gives them a sense of something that really touches on all these things. And it's, it's not only fun, but it's actually relatively easy um, and not different in cost than picking up your vegetables once a week. We try to keep it that way. Um, because our, our mission at Sunray is to cultivate community. And just as an aside, this show uh, is sponsored by a foundation, the Mayor Foundation, um, and much of our work at Sunraven is also similarly supported um, because we try to reach out to community and people in the community who can't necessarily always afford these things, um, and that it's, it's part of our intention, really, to make these things accessible. And I think that um, the from speaking to our, our members, um, what they enjoy the most um, is the community aspect, is the, um, the engagement with nature. Yes, they appreciate the produce, um, but it's, it's really learning how to grow it that motivates them and that you know, feeds their soul. Um, and so uh, we try to touch on all aspects of a person's health and wellness and not, you know, not just have someone come and pick up a box of produce on a weekly basis. Yeah, so that's our plan. So, you know what, Zena, let's take a break. Uh, I want to give out a number. I want to. I want you to, if you're interested in what we're talking about and have a question or have a thought you want to share with us, I want to invite you to call us. The number is 914-636-0110. Again, it's 914-636-0110. I'm talking to Zena D'Ambrosi, who's the Slow Medicine Horticulturalist, about gardening and health. And call us if you'd like to join our conversation. We'll be back in a minute. You're listening to Slow Medicine Radio. You can find out more about the show and the work of Dr. Michael Finkelstein by visiting his website, slowmedicinedoctor.com. Slow Medicine Radio is sponsored by the Slow Medicine Foundation, dedicated to providing community-centered, experiential, and reflective learning for individuals, families, and groups. Offering educational programs, events, and resources, as well as insightful health evaluations with customized medical guidance. Dr. Finkelstein works with his wife, Robin Queen Finkelstein, at their farm, Sunraven, in Bedford, New York. And they invite you to visit and take advantage of this unique resource, including men's and women's groups and couples programs. If you think about it, much of what we experience when we don't feel well is a result of the fast world and how it affects us. Therefore, if fast is the disease, then slow is the medicine. Visit Sunraven, the home of Slow Medicine in Bedford, New York. Go to slowmedicinedoctor.com or call 914-218-3113. 
And thank you for tuning in Mondays at 5 p.m. right here on 1460 WVOX. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Finkelstein, and I'm here with Senia D'Ambrosi, who's the slow medicine horticulturalist, and we've been talking about gardening and gardening for your health. And I want to invite you to call us, 914-636-0110, and share any of your thoughts or questions. Um, Maybe you're thinking to yourself, you live in New York City or the Bronx or Southern Westchester, you know, is it practical for you to come to Sunraven to do any of our programs? And and the answer is, uh, what I would say is that we get many people who travel. Uh, We've had a bunch of people from Brooklyn, which is even further uh, when you consider just how you have to get to, you know, through the city and then up to Westchester. People are making the effort because I think people realize um, this effort is worthwhile. Um, and hopefully what we do, you know, can provide you is um, feels really good. And many of our programs include food, food raised at the garden, which is always um, another good reason to show up. So, you know, what are the other programs that you think um, we might talk about, you know, that people might be interested in? Um, Well, many of the workshops that we are providing to the Garden Co-op members are also open to the public. And so uh, beginning in um, April, uh, we will have monthly workshops, again, on um, topics like seed starting or planning a garden. Um, But um, come out, go outside the garden and think about issues um, or touch on issues of sustainability, planting for pollinators, or creating um, uh, an herb garden and utilizing nature's medicine chest, if you will, um, to uh, things that you can do at home, canning and preserving. All of those workshops are open to the public. Um, In addition, um, we are going to be providing some community programming, um, having lectures um, or movie nights, Again, on topics that have to do with health and wellness and how um, the the garden or connection to nature can help you achieve that. Um, We are having, um, we've got some uh, partners that um, we're bringing in for cooking classes um, and um, some of the other uh, programming that is provided by the Slow Medicine um, team. uh, several or all who have been on your program recently. Um, so these kind of special events and community gatherings are all an op- opportunity that will be open to the public and will be on our uh, Sunraven calendar. Um, and you can, I guess, go on the website and uh, register for uh, to keep up to uh, up to date on the events happening there. Um, and um, I think that uh, we're also going to be um, providing some seasonal uh, retreats, these one-day retreats where you can really be immersed in uh, Sun Raven and um, and its services and and what the uh, the farm there has to offer. Um, and so uh, every season we're going to change it up a bit, but um, it will touch on um, you know gardening and nutrition, um, also uh, goal setting and several other topics that we'll be exploring. Um, and we'll start to uh, put that programming together um, and uh, look for some of that in the early, uh, late winter, early spring. Yeah, that's great. We also have, um, because many people ask us, and many people ultimately start coming regularly to many of these programs because they realize that there is a really something very pleasurable about returning to a familiar place and seeing some familiar faces, uh, as well as, the specific programming aspect of it, you know, to facilitate this, understanding that people's time and money are valuable resources and limited. Uh, we have a membership also that we provide so that people who anticipate maybe coming, you know, to several programs through the course of the year um, can sort of subscribe um, and then get discounts on everything that we offer. Um, just as an aside, if you become a member of the Garden Co-op, Membership is automatically included with that, which means discounts on everything else that goes on. Um, so anyway, it's just a, a effort on our part, really, to just reach out to as many people as we can. Um, the show is one example of what we do. 
Uh, Jamie, one of the subjects that I know is really important to you is sustainability. You know, you mentioned it in, in passing in terms of one of the workshop ideas is about sustainability, but I know it, it goes well into, is in your mind and almost everything that you choose to do. I uh, wonder how that plays out and how, you know, maybe developing the concept with us a little further because sustainability is one of those words we hear a lot lately. Mm-hmm. And it may mean slightly different things to different people and, and people I always find sometimes start taking liberties and license with certain words. What do you, what do you mean when you say sustainability? Um, when I began to understand and learn about sustainability, it was in the world of gardening, but I have since expanded that to um, to every aspect of my of my life and lifestyle. So, um, to me, fundamentally, it means making a conscious choice a conscious choice to be a steward of our land. Um, and a steward of our uh, own health. And um, in the garden, uh, sustainability and sustainable choices uh, mean um, kind of creating um, a system whereby you're um, feeding the soil, so you're developing compost systems, um, and you are uh, fertilizing naturally. Um, you are choosing plants um, that are... Uh, native, um, when you're talking about the landscape, um, or that have uh, uh, minimal maintenance requirements that are uh, not a big demand on our resources, on our water resources, for instance. Um, You are um, maintaining the plants in a sustainable way, so you are not using um, synthetic fertilizers or um, or, uh, pest um, herbicides or anything like that, you know, herbicides or pesticides on your plants, um, that you are uh, harvesting in a responsible way. Um, and that includes not just in the garden, but outside if you're foraging. So you're making a conscious decision or a conscious choice that you are, yes, you're going to forage this, but you're going to leave some for the birds or you're going to leave uh, some for the plant to be able to regenerate. Um, and so sustainability um really touches on all aspects and all systems um, in, in nature and in the garden and uh, um, as well um, developing an appreciation for things that are grown locally um, or um, and that expands not just from food there's a movement a slow food movement that um, that is based on knowing you know where your food comes from learning uh, getting to know your farmer and um, and in that way, um, having some control or some um, impact on you know how your food is grown and um, both how it's grown in the garden, but also in the marketplace. You know, making sure that that demand drives um, a good uh, farming practices. Um, but that expands as well into um, into the flower world, um, which is near and dear to me. Um, at Sun Raven, I have the opportunity to um, grow and teach about growing produce, and we've incorporated herbs and we've incorporated flowers um, at Sweet Earth, um, which is um, my home. I've I've taken almost every inch that I can to plant um, flowers and herbs. Um, I just I love being around flowers and plants and. Um, learning about how about the flower industry and the flower culture um i realized that that world needed improving as well and um and teaching people uh, about the importance uh, of growing sustainable flowers is um also near and dear to me so i do that at sweet earth um we grow uh sustainable flowers and herbs and we um we sell them locally and we provide a csa there as well for flowers um and so Sustainability, you know, kind of covers a lot, um, but uh, at the fundamental level, it's making a conscious choice about stewardship. Yeah, you know, when you use that word <clears throat> conscious in the context of the discussion on sustainability, and then you talked about slow food, you know, the origin of slow food was when McDonald's opened up its first franchise in Italy, in Florence, and the local people were saying, if fast food comes to Florence, we need to make sure that we don't lose our slow food. And the slow food in Florence wasn't something they needed to think about previously. It was just the way it was. Mm-hmm. 
but there clearly was an encroachment of this mindset, which was an unconscious way of just swallowing whole, essentially, food material, uh, and I use that term loosely, um, that, you know, sort of was the quick fix to being hungry, if you want to go to the comparison of where I came up with slow medicine. And, you know, this was about restoring or maintaining consciousness in the practice of eating. And then when you're conscious, you realize that that act of eating, when it's eventually on your plate, goes way back to, you know, when the farmer decided to plant that seed in the ground and then what it took for that seed to be nurtured to the point that it produced something that wound up on your plate. And that string of relationships and the energy involved in it, it you know, took months. Uh, and then if you really want to take it all the way back, it goes all the way back to when that particular seed variety was cultivated or, or you know, identified. And then if you want to go way back, it's to when the earth was actually formed and all that stuff started to go into motion and maybe the universe. So this consciousness connects us to the vastness of life. And if that's on your plate when you're eating, not just the burger that has, you know, a thousand calories that might satiate you for, you know, the next two hours, but something that can sustain your being, your conscious being, your soul indefinitely. And this is what you need for nourishment. That, to me, is the true definition of nourishment. I think that um, fast food uh, was a, a, a band-aid, right? It was a quick fix mm -hmm. to um, a very fast-paced lifestyle, um, one that often threw us off balance. And I think taking a step back and, um, and gaining a, an appreciation and a respect and an awe for um, how things are grown flowers, food, um, and how it's uh, nurtured to the point of, you know, when it's introduced on your plate. Um, besides the nutrients and the vitamins that it provides, it's that understanding and that appreciation and that respect that really nurtures you as well. Yeah. When I, when we, we have spoken about the programs that we're creating, particularly the garden program, where people ask me to describe it in a couple of words as opposed to a few minutes, I basically say we're cultivating healthy humans. You know, that what we're, what we're trying to accomplish there is, is methodology that through its full thickness, through the, all the different elements brought together, this healthy multitasking combined to create a healthy human being, which is predicated on their working relationships with the natural world and other people and the divine, um, their own thoughts and emotions and feelings and, and their body, of course, uh, bring these all together because you, can, you can't drive a car with two good tires. You, know, you need all four to work. And so for a healthy human being, we need all those different areas to be operating pretty effectively to, to get anywhere. And in balance. And in balance. And, and so consciousness is such a big part of that. And when we have, we've all suffered, I think, from this fast world. Uh, and, you know, you can say at times we all need fast. Uh, you know, you need to get to a hospital fast if you're having a heart attack. You need you know, the doctor team to cut into the hospital quickly to, you know, to open your chest if you need immediate bypass surgery. You know, those are things that are remarkable now, and they save lives. But those are really quite infrequent, relatively speaking, than times that we need fast like that. Uh, what we really need is, is to be in balance and in rhythm, not slow to, like, stop. We don't need to be snails crawling mm -hmm. on the ground never getting anywhere. But we need to be in our balance. And as human beings, for the most part, that's about the pace of walking or it's about the pace of eating a meal with a knife and a fork seated in conversation with somebody else with flowers and candles on the table. That environment is about the right rhythm for digestion. You know, without that, if we think we're going to sort of get the nutrients, the same nutrients into our system through our veins, we're, we're wrong. And we know that people are not healthier in the United States uh, compared to other places of the world, despite our technology despite the, the overwhelming number of resources we have, even though we can complain about the distribution, we still have a lot of resources here on this continent compared to other places of the world, and people are still not really healthy in mind, you know, and their bodies, it's very questionable. Um, I think that our lifestyle, that fast-paced lifestyle, really um, is a, oftentimes a detriment, and um, while it can help in some areas, um, in other areas, it throws us off balance, and it um, 
it sometimes uh, creates um, new troubles and new uh, illnesses. Um, and so um, kind of helping people um, learn where, you know, how to grow this food and where it's coming from and taking the time to um, cultivate it and, uh, and to incorporate it into their lifestyle, um, we, see, we see the impact that it has on, their, on improving their, their health and their wellness, and which is why they return to um, Sunraven and to other programs similar to that. Yeah, I know when you know we walk through the garden, we see something like a pest of some sort, like spots on the plants or a certain type of insect. Um, your first response is, "Hey, that's a pesticide deficiency." You know you, that we need to spray it. You know, your first response has been, "Let's look at the soil." You know, let's let's look around this plant and see what's going on that it may not be as strong as it needed to be, and that's why it's vulnerable to this infestation. And so in health systems, human health systems, you know, when we get, you know, a rash, when we have something on our skin, when we get infected, it's not that we have an antibiotic deficiency or a prednisone deficiency or a cream deficiency. Um, It's that we, something's out of balance. And it's very often our microbiome, this intestinal tract, you know, balance of the different organisms and other things that allow our immune system to stay strong, our skin barrier to be strong. Those are the two most frequent areas of intrusion in our system. I um, I often uh, compare you know our health to um, to that of a plant in the garden. I I usually take a soil sample and send it out for testing, and I review the results. And um, you know the soil test will tell you where there are um, you know an abundance of this mineral or um, a deficiency in another, and your um, your approach to um, managing that is really to try to bring it into a balance and bring the plant to, to this kind of range where it can access, you know, all of the nutrients and all of the minerals. Um, And I see that I I draw that same parallel to our health. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I, but I take it outside of the pharmaceutical, if you will, outside and, and see what other aspects um, I'm being, you know, are deficient in my life, or um, are creating too much of an impact that are that's throwing me off balance. Right. So the pharmacy that we need is spelled F A R M A C Y. Correct. <laughs> One other thing I wanted to make sure we mentioned about the program is that um, uh, it is for the family. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's uh, yes, individuals can sign up, but the membership and the uh, garden co-op membership is a family membership and so it's an opportunity to um, experience um, the garden and the garden and Sun Raven uh, not just a one-on-one but also to bring you know your family and um, right. they can you know they can be in the garden or they can enjoy other aspects of the Sun Raven farm a lot of people have also asked you know that you know their their physical body doesn't allow them to do a lot of work you know and none of this is really predicated on you being the workforce, you know, in moving he- heavy objects or lifting. There are a lot of different tasks that we do to keep a, a farm operating. Some of them is just sorting flowers, as an example. So we remember when we harvested the chamomile, we had to separate the chamomile flower heads from the stems. That was relatively tedious, perfect job for somebody to sit at a table and to do, and so beautiful and obviously very fragrant. There are tasks like that all the time. There are seeds that need mm-hmm. to be sorted or counted or organized There are things that, you know, inventories, there's communication, there's recipes that we exchange. There's all sorts of different ways that people can really be engaged and and sort of, you know, sort of follow the the work commitments. And there's an opportunity this year for people not to need to do any of that work. Um, You know, there's two types of membership. One is people who do work and others who are willing to sort of pay a slightly additional amount just to be able to participate in what they want without having any requirements. Right. There is a general requirement one day a month um, where um, we ask everybody to join in um, and help with tasks. And that is not only to get the work done, but also to make sure that we provide an opportunity for community. Um, But then there are another the other membership is for those who do want to get more access to the garden, more hands on um, and uh, and help out in in managing the Garden Co-op program. So like you said, I mean, people can get to our website, slowmedicine.org, and get all this information. How can they find out more about your work? 
Um, well, I have a website as well. It's uh, it's uh, sweetearthco.com. Um, I'm on Instagram and Facebook, uh, Sweet Earth Co. And um, at, at my website, you can find out about the different projects I'm engaged in, uh, workshops and lectures, uh, places that you can uh, find our produce or our flowers. Um, so I invite you to come and have a look. And I definitely will. And I look forward to sharing this next coming season with you and developing all that's in the works and sharing it with all of you who are listening, who are interested. Uh, other things that we're doing in the next month include an open house for the men's group that I run uh, twice a month on Monday evenings. Uh, the next meeting will be Monday, January 9th. That's a week from today at 7 o'clock. Uh, we also have a, a workshop with our Slow Medicine Abundist on Saturday the 21st. And we have the beginning of a three-month cooking program that begins on Tuesday, January 24th. And a new moon ceremony for this month's new moon at the end of the month, um, which will be on Thursday, January 26th. And all those programs and more information can be found on the slowmedicine.org website. I want to thank you for listening. I really hope this year ahead is one filled with health, abundance, happiness, wholeness for all of us. And I will speak to you next week. So take care.